Thank you for joining the Detroit Buy, Hold, Invest podcast. I'm your host, David Rabior, broadcasting live from the Renaissance City, the pinnacle of the Midwest, Detroit, Michigan. And today, we're going to get into a very special part two with my friend and co-host uh, for the day, Adam Cook. Adam, how you doing? Good, brother. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Um, so on the last podcast, it was very interesting. We talked a little bit about the this is and the that's about real estate, how to do it, how not to do it, all that good stuff. And uh, you wanted to come on the show to talk about uh, crypto and and your experience with it and what you're doing and, and how you believe that someone can build wealth through crypto, particularly, well, particularly- uh, Bitcoin. So uh, let's uh, let's get into that. Tell us a little bit about uh, aside from real estate, like what you're doing and, and give us some background. And I'll just kind of sit back and listen and ask questions as you uh, unfold these uh, biblical uh, scriptures that you're about to recite. Right on. Uh, so, yeah, at the end of our um, last podcast, you mentioned, you know, the cost of living and really everyone struggling and that is um, because of inflation. So a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what inflation is. Most people think it's like uh, prices increasing. Some people will say it's corporate greed. Um, but essentially anyone you ask on the street, be like, oh, it's when the prices go up. Let's be uh, clear. It's not just Joe Biden, right? It's not just sleepy. Right. No. It's not FJB. It's not uh, it's not Trump. It's not the Illuminati. Right. It's like a collective group of uh, of uh, misappropriation of the public interest. Uh, uh, but that's that's just what I say. But it's basically just the cost of living is going up for a lot of different reasons. And let's shed some light on what you believe, why that is and and how that is. And like, what what do we do as people to kind of avoid getting, um, you know, sexually assaulted by our wallets yeah i mean it's a little bit of all of those things like it is government intervention but really in in america it's the federal reserve so inflation the basic definition of inflation like i said has nothing to do with the increase in prices the increase in prices are actually the response it's the result of inflation so Mm -hmm. inflation is essentially just the expansion of the money base Right, so right. what we like to call printing money. So the U.S. Fed or the, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government through creation of credit and literally just adding numbers to their balance sheet increase the supply of money in the system. So money is just like any other market good. Um, it's subject to supply and demand. Yeah, so yeah. if you can think about, hey, there's 100 houses in Detroit, And, you know, the governor of Michigan or the mayor of Detroit, um, you know, has a million dollars, but then he decides to print two million dollars more. So now there's three million dollars in the system. There's still only 100 houses. But because there's now artificial demand, the price of those houses go up. So if I if in a micro version of that is I have one hundred dollars, you have one hundred dollars. If the governor prints, you know, four hundred dollars and gives us both two hundred dollars more, now we each have three hundred dollars. We're trying to bid on the same house. What's going to happen in the price of that house? It's going to go up. It's going to go. It's going to go up. <laughs> yeah, that's so what's happening right now. Yeah. So that's not an example of the house being worth anymore. The house is the exact same. It hasn't changed. It's the fact that there's more money in the system. Yeah. So part of it. Um, you know, like in Miami, South Beach, that was or Miami in general. It was like a big haven for people in New York, uh, Michigan, New Jersey, who were locked down for years, literally, and during COVID. And they were looking for an escape. You know, they wanted the prices here were cheap compared to there. So yeah. there is there is a hundred percent demand is involved. Um, in Detroit, we just I'm sure you saw this and and. The viewers saw this that Detroit just had its first population increase, yeah, in seventy years since like nineteen fifty eight or fifty seven, yeah. yeah, which is an amazing accomplishment. So you know, yeah, they Detroit. It's, a lot's gone down. And and uh, two things I wanted to say: the problem that we have here is 
people, so many people got locked into those under 3% interest rates. Like when the post COVID refinance boom took place that like right now, it's not really in the best interest of someone in that position with a ton of equity and low interest rate on their current note or whatever to yes. like sell their house and then go into a new one and pay an inflated price and then buy at what could potentially be seven and a half percent interest uh, and pay a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of money. The other side of it is people like the regular blue collar people, let's say, you know, in, in the median, the median income here supports a sale price between like 90 and like 180 grand for the most part, because people just don't make a lot of money here. So that's where the majority of people are looking. And that's where like your core buyer base is. And then as you go up in price, like the buyer pool decreases and now you don't have a lot of, of supply, but also, and that, that makes the prices stay up or continue to rise a little bit. But the problem is, is like at, let's say 125,000, you know, five years ago, you could buy a house like that with taxes and insurance included in your payment for like 950 bucks. Now it's 1300. So now that person is renting for like 1300 bucks and everybody on the internet and the TV and their friends are all telling them, Hey, you shouldn't buy right now because it's too expensive. And, and then they're looking at it going, well, do I take on the responsibility of a house and particularly a first time home buyer who barely has enough money to put down for like an FHA loan or something like that, and then go into a house that they're going to have to buy that needs some stuff. They don't have the money or do they continue to rent at 1300 and then just kind of wait for things to settle down, which I don't believe that we're anywhere near things going backwards, you know, interest rates yeah. going down extremely. Uh, I don't believe that we're going to see an influx of inventory because uh, what they did post COVID basically stopped all those foreclosures that would have happened and forced banks to remod, you know, these balances and stuff. So that eliminated a lot of the opportunity that I was just waiting for. I mean, I was waiting for that. I was just foaming at the mouth waiting for all these foreclosures to hit and they just really didn't and now you're seeing them trickle out a little bit at a time but then they're hitting like the hud home store where they're exclusive and you can't even bid on them as an investor for 30 days and home buyers are picking them up so that's the problem with michigan right now and i know miami there's a decrease like we were in sarasota a couple months ago and sarasota is beautiful and it's really not that expensive in perspective to like the detroit market as long as you don't live on the water you go buy a house there for between 200 and 300 thousand bucks and you know you get a decent house but they have all this hurricane stuff and i got to talking to locals there and you know particularly people that were older you know that had uh came from other markets and i'm like you know what's the deal with this market here and most of them said we're moving out of here and i'm like well why would you do that they can't even get insurance on their houses like because of all the hurricane stuff and whatever so that's creating like alabama and and those southern gulf states which still are like an uppercut punch for those those uh hurricanes you know they come mm -hmm. right in there and wreck everything so there's a you know with every market you know, there's these type of things, but in Michigan, particularly, I think the reason why we're seeing the prices stay high is there's just not enough inventory. And let's say we get 10 houses, two of them are really, truly turnkey where someone can buy it, move in and not really have to do anything. The rest of them are kind of fixed fixer upper. So you have two factors, one, the interest rates and the higher payment. And two, these younger people who are buying, they really just don't have the physical skill or knowledge to do these uh -oh. type of things like we do, you know, I can go out and, and I can put a deck on, I can put gutters up. I can do all these things. I have the tools to do it, but younger yeah. people really, if they're going to leverage all they got pay more than they should, and then pay, you know, super high interest rates, they're just not really willing to do it. And you have a lot of buyer's agents and I'll end it with this. I know a lot of buyer's agents, you know, and they're always calling me, asking me for advice. And I know you know, post COVID, it was nuts. And all of them were really working hard and writing tons of offers to not get shit. And then before that, they were going out a couple weekends showing, you know, six, 10 houses, writing a couple offers and getting an offer accepted. And now on average, they're, they're showing between 20 and 30 houses and writing 10 offers to get one accepted. So they're working like triple hard th than they ever were. And it's become frustrating. A lot of them are bailing out of the industry. And uh, a lot of clients are are also not committing because of you know, the market and all these things I mentioned. So anyway, go on with uh, what you're saying. I went on a tangent, but I think that that's important for people to understand. For sure. Um, I want to tell a story eventually about Mr. and Mrs. Claiborne. That was my experience um, with this last uh, 
annual property tax negotiation in Detroit. Okay. But before that, like uh, before I get into that story, maybe we can do it another episode. Yeah, sure. um, but I no, I won't forget that story. It's it's really fucked up. But um, what you're talking about also is, yes, the inventory sucks. Um, part of that is because what you said, um, you know, the Fed artificially lowered interest rates. So there it's a centralized system. They control that system. Yeah. We're not allowed to, de- you know, the free market doesn't determine the interest rates. They do. No. So they created this artificial environment where everyone was able to basically get, you know, those two, 3% loans, which is insane. If you got those, congratulations. Good Free job. money, man. Yeah. I got 2.675 on my refinance for my personal house because it was like amazing. free money. Like, why would I yeah. not do that? Yeah. And like, you know, why would you sell? Of course you wouldn't. So that really, really affects the um, inventory. But, you know, real estate. So inflation CPI, let's go to CPI. CPI is a complete scam. They say it's, you know, 3%, 3, 4, 2. The goal is 2%. Yeah. Uh, our basic definition of inflation is the expansion of the monetary supply. Prior to COVID, the average inflation rate was 7%. Mm-hmm. So it's more than triple their 2% CPI goal. And and that's obvious when you look at real estate. Yeah. Um, you know, in Detroit, Yes, we recently experienced a slight uptick in population growth, but you know, year over year, there was not a 40% demand increase for real estate in Detroit. There just wasn't. No. Um, it was the more it was the dollars in the system. And something that's really, really key to Detroit being that it's been, you know, in economic turmoil mm-hmm. and um, you know, relatively poor compared to the rest of the country is as those inflation seeks the hardest assets. So it seeks real estate, gold, stocks, now Bitcoin, um, and basically anywhere you can store your wealth. So we call them stores of value. Uh, So of course, that's why real estate went up. And when that happens, the poorest people are hit the hardest. Because these first time first time home buyers, like you said, they don't have the resources to do everything that you just said they can do. Yeah. And if you're poor and you're saying, "Oh, you know, pre COVID 2019, I only need ten thousand. I have to if I save ten thousand dollars, then I can afford a down payment, and then I can buy that house I've always wanted to buy." Post COVID, you know, what did it go to? Fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. Now they cannot get access to that property. And not only yep. can they not get access to that property, but that's where that wealth gap occurs. Because yeah. people like you and I were fortunate enough to own assets. Yeah. And so our our equity, you know, our appreciation grows as the money system expands. But these people at the bottom rung, they're constant. That's the rat race. That's the yeah. real rat race. Yeah, their wages they're stay to- the same. Everything goes up. And senior citizens, too, on fixed incomes, which fixed I income. am so sick and tired of seeing is like a senior citizen who gets Social Security and they're getting, let's say, $1,400 a month or $1,500 a month. And they go to the grocery store and now they have to say, well, I I can't buy this food. I have to buy my prescriptions, which also have went up. So now they're basically trading uh, medication for food or they're trading food for medication to stay alive. And then everything else is going up. So their money don't go up. So now they have zero money for anything other than their essential needs. And that is a fundamental problem in this country that I'm sick and tired of seeing. And it's not right, especially for veterans and senior citizens. That's that's a direct result of inflation yeah and our Um, money being worth jack shit yeah so that's uh that's actually a good segue to mr and mrs claiborne yeah um but uh i was gonna say something else but i don't remember um oh like that's also part what you're talking about with like the medicine versus food there's a economic term um regarding inflation called uh substitution effect i believe but it's basically like if i'm a red meat eater and like if i can't afford red meat with inflation then i'm gonna have to substitute it with chicken and cpi doesn't capture that shit right like but my diet my lifestyle had to change so if you guys are interested in the substitution effect i believe that's technical term but just google substitution effect effect with inflation or cpi and you you can learn all about it but mr and mrs claiborne so i was at the (laughs) uh the property tax uh hearings where you get to negotiate and it's like, yes, yeah. 
It's not even a ne- negotiation. It's a shakedown. That's yeah, what it of is. course it is. And um, especially in Detroit, because they did a broad reanalysis and assessment of houses that they never even physically looked at. Yeah. So another example of um, inflation where it pops up is, you know, some of my properties, way too many had like 50 percent bumps year over year. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, this is kind of illegal, I think. I yeah, think they've the max is like 5%. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another story. But Mr. and Mrs. Claiborne, they're in the hearing. You know, they're going through this. They're like, uh, you know, our property taxes just went through the roof. We've been living in this house since like 1992 or something like that. And this is a sweet old couple. They're adorable. And they're people who have played it by the book their entire life. Yep. They were on fixed income. You know, they were probably school teachers or nurses or, you know, some blue collar job, you know, br- brought up with the ethos of work hard, you know, spend less than you earn, be prudent, be responsible, and everything's going to work out. The Dave and, Ramsey mentality. Yeah. And they are feeling it now because yep. that is because of inflation. Yep. So, um, victimized by the system that they stood behind for their whole lives right exactly and they're they're like you know just sitting there and taking it and you know i don't know if it's good or bad but my microphone was unmiked so of course i spoke up because i'm like this is disgusting yeah you know you guys are basically trying to run these people out of their homes um you know but this is again an example of inflation they're saying oh we have to fix the roof the the roof used to be quoted at Eight grand. Now it's 15. Uh, we have maintenance on the house. Our maintenance costs have gone up. Our insurance has gone up. Our utilities. property taxes are now going up. Yeah, yeah. Our utilities, all of our costs. And we're on fixed income. We're going to have to sell our house. And I think downsizing, you know, this meme of downsizing, I think a lot of it is just coping mechanism. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, we don't want to take care. I think that's it happens for sure. But I think most of that is bullshit. I think it's old people having to deal with the reality of their dollars being worth less than it was before. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Um, so that's just like a really gross, you know, in economics, we talk about like numbers and all this stuff. And some people who don't understand it, like, Oh, you know, you guys just care about money and this and that. It's like, no, these are real people. Yep. These are obvious. It's, it's apparent to me that these are good, solid people. And they're the ones who are getting fucked. Yeah. It's not me and you. No. Like we're we're good. Yeah, we're opportunists. So we're chasing, yeah. you know, we're entrepreneurs. Yeah. And fortunately, again, we own assets. We own those those properties that, you know, appreciate appreciate or absorb some of that in- inflationary. Yeah. And I'm also aspect. buying I'm also buying that house from them when they decide to sell. I'm one of those people. Exactly. And turning so talk it about- on. Yeah, gentrification. Money yeah. yeah, gentrification. And then what do you do when you when you buy it or if you flip it? Like, you know, then you're improving the house and then the, the price goes up again because you've improved it so much more. Yep. And the tax and then the, base. And then and then the tax base goes up. Yep. Right. So it's really one big scam in Ponzi. And it's really gross that real people, you know, that have done everything that they could to do things right their entire life are getting screwed. So that's kind of where Bitcoin comes in. People call Bitcoin a, a hedge against inflation. Um, I don't know if that's exactly true because there is a hard cap on Bitcoin where eventually we won't be able to make any more. Right now, the inflation rate of Bitcoin is, uh, I think it's around 0.7%, which makes it the least inflationary money in human history. It used to be gold. So gold on average would inflate around one and a half to 2% every year. Yeah. And what is what does that mean? That's mining. So, you know, there's a stock of gold that exists in the world all the time. And then there's miners all around the world that go into the ground, dig it up and sell it on the market. So that's that's the expansion of gold, right? The expansion of monetary base of gold is through the mining process, which has been historically one and a half to two percent. So there was something called the having that just happens uh, about a month ago now, um, where the supply issuance of Bitcoin got cut in half again, which now makes it the hardest money in history. Like I said, so it's a approximately 0.7 percent, something like that, of uh, of inflation 
which eventually goes to zero. So it's not just that it's a hedge, it's that something that the government, you know, the city can't inflate. It's hard. It's a hard money. Yep. And what that means is if you start saving in Bitcoin instead of dollars, everything we just talked about doesn't just get easier, but it, it gets cheaper over time. So your maintenance costs go down in Bitcoin terms. Your cost to acquire property goes down in Bitcoin terms. Um, the ability for the government to steal your wealth and savings goes down. All of these. So you, when you adopt a Bitcoin standard or Bitcoin mentality and you start saving in Bitcoin, it allows you to to plan for the future much better. Um, it allows you to uh, uh, you know address these issues like. Mr. and Mrs. Claiborne want to retire. If Mr. and Mrs. Claiborne retired on a gold standard or a Bitcoin standard, we wouldn't be having that conversation about them. They wouldn't no. be in that meeting. No. They might be there to be like, hey, screw you guys, stop increasing my my taxes, but they wouldn't be in the position where they need to sell their house. Right. Um, so that's like the over, you know, the I, I think, you know, people don't really understand the problem. And that's why it's so important to talk about stuff like inflation and government overreach and theft and stuff like that because there's such a misconception with inflation that they don't you can tell them what bitcoin is but they don't really understand because they don't know what the problem is they see things getting more expensive they say why why the fuck is everything more expensive it's getting harder and harder and harder i just got a raise i work really hard it's so demoralizing yeah. It's like it's a big driver of, you know, the cynicism and nihilism and the rioting and all all the sociocultural downtrends, like, you know, the moral and integrity of our nation. It's all related and connected to inflation, which just makes it feel like, why am I why am I participating anymore? Right. This is all so fucked up. Like, yep. it's it's a rig. And so, yeah, I mean, it's the yeah. reason why, uh, you know, I just read uh, an article the other day, like the McChicken at McDonald's. You remember it was like a dollar. Now it's like three bucks. Yep. You know what I mean? Like yep. people, well, you can't pay a fast food worker $15 an hour. Well, they're doing it now. And now, you know, to buy a value meal is like 13 bucks when you used to pay five bucks or six bucks or whatever. So and that's what the primary forage is of the salt to the earth, man. Like the dollar menu, you know, yep. at the fast food place or ramen noodles, or they're going to save a lot, you know, to buy their groceries and this and that and the other thing. And uh, it, it's a sad place that we've gotten. So we have to take advantage of things other than what the norm is, quote unquote. And like Bitcoin is definitely one of those things. I mean, we've watched it go from 40,000 to 20,000 to 65,000. And now it's on the race for 100,000. And, and it could be a million. I mean, we just don't know. And the greatest part is that no one's controlling this. Uh, government wise, you know, because our government, if you look at the way that they run their business, like any business that ran their business with the kind of debt ratio that our government has would be out of business. There's no way at some point they at some point we have to as a nation say we're not fucking paying you people back and reset and just deal with the consequences because you're never buying your way out of the trillions in debt that we're no. in. It's no. there's no way possible. It, yeah, it's impossible, and and then our treasury bonds and things like that are owned by China and the very, you know nations that we start conflicts with and and say you know that we're gonna do all this reform, we're gonna tax them, and we fucked up their way to ship their goods from here, you know, from there to here, and all this stuff. They own our money, and they're know? selling it. Yeah, exactly, and and it's just people. I think regular people don't really look past their day-to-day -day lives you know right. and and then you got these real like extremist people that go on the social media and they're like really they're really broad in their claims and they and they say a lot of things that are like shocking up, but at the end of the day you really understand when you're knowledgeable that they 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 they're, they're the equivalent to the people in my opinion they're the equivalent to the like the redneck american guy who was like trump this trump that and trump would come to town and they'd go and they'd have their rallies but they didn't understand like this guy wouldn't get out of his car to piss on you if you're on fire 
Yeah. You're not his demographic. You're not who he supports. But if you're going to jump on the wagon, like, of course, he's going to, you know, rah, rah and say, I'm for you, whatever. The guy's a billionaire. He's for his own best interests. And that's not saying that, you know, he's a bad guy, because when you're a businessman and you get to that point in life, everybody's out to get you. And which we're seeing right now. And, uh, you know, this country, I think we learned. Uh, post COVID or like when COVID was going on, how easy that people can be manipulated through social media and the, in the media in general. And those people just hook, line and sinker. And this whole population in the world is really controlled by a narrative that is decided by the same people who we should be fighting against uh, and, and using our brain to like, look at things for what it really is. And I think that Bitcoin or crypto in general is something that these people don't have influence on and they can't figure out how to get influence on it. And that makes it a protected species for people to, um, you know, put their money into it and and take advantage of it. And then the real point, like once you do, how do you cash out? You know, what's the end game for someone who invests in crypto that wants to eventually retire and, you know, all that stuff. Well, yeah, first of all, based, you know, from what you're saying, like for me, Bitcoin, I've always like kind of rooted for the little guy, you know, I'm a, I train fighting, but I'm a pacifist really. Yeah. But it's really the biggest protest I can, me buying Bitcoin every single day in my life, which I do is the biggest protest I can make against those, everything you just said. Yeah. Um, and for me, my end game is I'm, you know, just like with real estate, you know, if I get a great offer, if say I grow my portfolio big enough and BlackRock makes me, me an offer, presumably BlackRock is going to make me a great offer. That's going to be hard to say right. no to. Yeah. Not pennies on the dollar. <laughs> what yeah. you would expect. Yeah. But yeah, it's not going to be some some dickhead wholesaler who's, you know, going to offer me 50% of what, you know, it's cash flowing at or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a real offer. So in that scenario, maybe I'm going to sell. But generally speaking, in the absence of that, I'm never going to sell my real estate. You know, like, why would I? Yeah. Like, it makes me money every year. Yep. It's appreciating in value every year. So I can use it as a vehicle to refinance, pull more out, right. buy more, and et cetera, et cetera. It. Yep. Yeah. Which now with my personal stuff, and hopefully I'll be able to convince my other partners for Detroit Renaissance Fund. Um, for my personal stuff, I pull my loans out and I, I buy Bitcoin with it. With my rental income, I take a portion of that every every month and I buy Bitcoin with it. So my end game with Bitcoin, it's same thing with real estate. Like, why would I, what am I going to sell it for? Uh, you know, maybe I could buy real estate with it if I feel like I need more cash flow. But the cumulative uh, uh, growth rate on Bitcoin, it's something absurd. It's so absurd, I don't even want to quote it. So let's just say it's like 50% every year. It's, it's a really, lot. It's for yeah. sure a lot. If you follow the trends over the last five years, I mean, it's been a race for the moon. Well, yeah. Since inception, it's like, I think it's like 200%, you know, cumulative growth rate, which is just, you know, ridiculous. It's not going to, it's not going to continue that pace. Right. So let's just say it's 50%. So I could sell Bitcoin and buy real estate. I would be losing that 50% appreciation. I would be trading that for real estate that might be appreciating, depending on the market and how much money's being, you know, pumped into the economy. Maybe it's appreciating 10% a year, and maybe I'm getting a cash flow of another 10% a year. So maybe let's just say I'm getting approximately 20% on my money annually, Mm -hmm. which is great, but it's not 50%. No. So I don't have to sell right now. There, there's some nascent products for borrowing against your Bitcoin. But, you know, when I'm 70, 60, 70, 80, whatever, whenever I'm retired or maybe sooner than that, I'm going to start lending out or borrowing against my Bitcoin. Yeah. Because it's the easy, it's such an easier collateral than real estate. Uh, You know, it's, it's extremely easy to verify, you know, with a click of button, I'm like, there it is, you know, here you go. I yeah. don't have to go through an appraisal. I don't need to do inspections. I don't I don't have to show the house or anything like that or right. like go through my 
you know, my credit history and any of that bullshit. It's or like, calling your financial advisor to borrow money from your own <laughs> investment and like have yeah. to beg for it and be told that you shouldn't do it and all that stuff. Yep. Today there today there are products. I'm not um gonna promote them or recommend them because again, all of this is new and I'm sure people who've heard Bitcoin and crypto have heard of all the the you know the tragedies and terror stories and stuff like that. So I'm not gonna promote any product, but there are products today where you don't need anyone's permission. You don't need anyone. No one can tell you you can't do this. All you need is your hardware wallet, which is basically like your self custody. Like, uh, you know, it's kind of like having cash in your pocket. Yeah. It's like, like your, digital cash in your pocket. Yeah. Your crypto bank account. Exactly. And only you have access to it and only you can use it. So you can go on a platform without anyone's it you know oh you can't do this fuck you yeah i'm gonna do whatever the hell i want with it's my money right this is what i'm gonna do exactly you can go on it today and you can borrow against your bitcoin like that like a few hundred bucks if you're savvy with it it might take you 10 minutes yeah and so that's that's today so well, those, think, those, think about if you're the lender like you come to me and so say easy. hey I want to leverage my Bitcoin. Even if you don't pay me more than likely, I'm going to win. Like, yeah. I, you know, long term, yeah, I'm going to win. So, yeah. And it's really interesting to see like what happens with real estate and lending and all that kind of stuff on a Bitcoin standard in the future. Um, you know, it's it seems like interest rates will probably drop because like you said, it's like, you know, if, if you default, I'm still in great shape because I, I get your Bitcoin. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm stoked it, about that. I think it, like in the market interest rate before the election, it's going to drop because they always do that. And they try to say, look at all the great things I've done and yeah. interest rates are down and I need another the four years, booming. four more years, you know, to bullshit <laughs> you and not get shit done, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So anyway, like it's very important though for people, you know, that are listening to understand that there are these opportunities that exist and like, you need to take the time to educate yourself and yeah. you need to also take the time to get someone to consult you, you know, if, if you're serious about investing into uh, things other than real estate, like I'm the guy, if you want to invest in real estate, I'm the guy to sit down and answer your questions and give you like really constructive advice and criticism in relation to like real estate. When it comes to Bitcoin, I'm not the guy, right? I'm, I'm not an expert. I understand it uh, for, you know, elementary standards. I understand that you buy it, it increases in value. I know how to cash it out and everything. And I do have some people who are having amazing success with investing in crypto in general, and they're doing it for their full-time like job and they're making tons of money doing it. Um, but I think that for the people that are listening to this podcast, it's very important to understand like this is not a fad. It's not a trend, but it's also not something that you should just jump and do by yourself and start shooting these moves without having somebody to help you or, or guide you through that process. And I think, you know, Adam is someone who, who could do that, you know, if somebody wanted to learn or be mentored in that, in that sense, uh, is that something that you're interested in doing for people, Adam? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, um, it's one of my focal points moving forward. Like this is all kind of new to me. And as far as like kind of promoting myself in this way, not really promoting myself quite yet, but I did start my social media. Um, and it's just like, you know, a, a guy from Miami beach or LA or whatever, going into Detroit, you know, to invest in section eight housing. Yeah. There's some, there's a lot of pitfalls and it's not because Bitcoin is corrupt or greedy or a scam. It's because the people, there's people still involved around the periphery that are just waiting for you to fall into it, their own trap. Oh yeah. The wolves, the wolves. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It happens um, every day. Yeah. So big part of my motivation is education and um, really like sharing what I'm doing, you know, basically what you're doing on this podcast is what I'm doing with my real estate stuff and Bitcoin. Yeah. And also like really, I feel like it's a perfect match for real estate investors. I feel like we get it, you know, the, we have long-term horizons. We understand there's um, a terminology uh, in Bitcoin called proof of work, um, POW acronym. And that's the idea of you only get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. Like, anything like you like can't, yeah, you, your your house, you know, ex like anything except for money printing, right? It doesn't take any effort for the Fed to print trillions of dollars overnight. 
Yeah. It's a flip of a switch. Right. The compare that with renovating one compare that with your house in East English village, a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Blood, blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. You know, a lot of work goes into that. And then in regards to the, you know, how people treat their own properties and the, uh, you know, the pride of ownership, like it, those houses that you see that are beautiful, it didn't happen by accident. No, like uh, a beautiful, uh, a, a talented ar- architect designed it, talented construction crew built it, and then the homeowners over the course of you know decades or centuries took really good care of it, right, and improved it, and you know did all of the things. I'll tell you, you know, a lot of people w- with the house I had on East English Village where I lost fifty thousand, people were like man, didn't that ruin you? Well, if I was a new investor, like some of the people that are coming to me and saying, Hey, I want to get started. And I really need someone to help me. And they're banking on me to do that. Like that person probably would have been financially destroyed. But me, I made 400 grand that year, even though I lost $50,000 and it didn't kill me, but $50,000 is $50,000. Like knowing I lost that, in the, I could have made $450,000, but I only made $400,000. That makes me upset to the point where I threw my hands up and said, you know what, screw everybody. I'm done. And I tried to not let that bleed into like my personal relationships, but I'll tell you, man, I was really upset about it. And uh, I was holding a grudge about it for probably a year before I started letting it go. And I, I have a very resilient mindset and I'm like thick skinned and I can just take it and take it and take it. But that was one that really stood me up, you know, in my tracks, because at that point in my life, I was really winning all the time. Like, you know, everything I was doing, I'm making money as an agent. I'm making money as an investor. I'm, you know, wholesaling some deals. I got people sending me houses left and right. People are calling me all the time and like everything is great. And I think I'm, you know, a seasoned veteran at that point. And even then, you know, what happened with me was I was so consumed with all of the other things that I left that into the hands of people who I thought I could depend on and they fucked it up. And then when I came in, the damage was done and there was no bandaid to fix the bleeding. And I had to just take it on the chin, you know, and uh, I don't want anyone who follows me or you or, or my business or whatever to experience these losses uh, by, you know, going out there and getting cocky and thinking they could just throw money around and everything's gonna be fine. Cause that's just not the case. Like, even if you had a million dollars and you went to, uh, you know, buy crypto and you bought a whole bunch of it, is there a chance that you would win long-term? Yeah. I mean, there is, but you could also go and put it into some love scam on the internet and lose all your fucking money. Like I just saw a dude do on TV uh, the other night I was watching, he got scammed off like social media. He was an older guy and he met some girl online and she started talking about, she had feelings for him and this and that. And then little by little, she kept asking him to send money uh, to her through crypto. You know what I mean? And, and she ripped him off for like his entire uh, in, uh, retirement income like over the period of a couple of years, like $400,000 uh, that happened. That, that was yeah. actually PSA on the guys. Dave Ramsey show. Yeah. Yeah. PSA guys don't send money to hot chicks on the internet. Yeah. And then there's, thing, idea. yeah. And there's things like Coinbase, you know, Coinbase is a, a website you go on and you can put your money into it and buy, you know, crypto, but then you're not in control of like your wallet. You're not right. in control of your money. And then, at the end of the year, if you've ever had crypto and you go to do your taxes, you know, now they're asking you because the government wants to know, like, have you sold any cryptocurrency this year? Because they're going to sink their teeth into that ass when yeah. you withdraw money through certain uh, avenues. So it's very important to like seek the advice of someone who has experience and a level of long-term success doing whatever it is you're trying to learn about. Don't just go to some freaking internet guru who's running ads on Instagram, you know, telling you how you can invest five bucks and become a millionaire in three years or whatever. Like go to people who like really have your best interest in mind and don't be opposed to understanding that someone who does that will want a fee for that consulting. And it's going to be worth it because you're going to make a lot of money and they're going to teach you how to do it. And you you have to be willing to understand that just like with real estate, you have to understand when I sell you something, I make a commission. If the seller pays me a commission, then you don't have a problem with it. But I have some people where it's like, they're not willing to pay a commission. You have to pay. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute, why should I have to pay? Because I just put you in front of a deal that you couldn't have got if it wasn't for me. 
Right. You know what I mean? That's not free. What do you think I'm doing? Is this is amateur night. Like I'm doing this for free. I'm not. And yeah. The situations where you're helping these people throughout the entire process, like, you know, like you said, like maybe the commission is three grand on both ends. So maybe you make six grand, but you helped them not make that East English village mistake. Right. Exactly. Right. Here's another so, example. Yeah. So I had the new investors that came to me recently and uh, they're, they're of financial means, right? So they want to buy houses and rent them and, and, you know, burr them out eventually or whatever. And, you know, I'm like, okay, great. So we look at the regular market and, you know, there's not really deals there that um, are on their side, right? I, like there's just not enough money in it for them to really effectively burr the property and pull all their money out. So I bring them an off market deal and I'm like, listen, the seller is my seller. And before I put it on the market, I'm going to get him to take your finance offer that you want to give and he's going to sell it to you. And the whole place is completely redone. You know, it's all done. They could put tenants right in there. They'll be all in for 130 grand or 140 grand, let's say. And like they're going to rent this for probably 2000 to $2,300 a month. And I'm like, I'm going to do it like a regular deal. The seller is going to pay a commission. And then each party pays a processing fee to me um, of 495 bucks, you know. And that's what I have to charge. That covers my uh, assistant. And that also covers what I'm going to get into after this. So what's going to happen is they don't want to pay the 495, right? They're like, we don't understand why you're charging the fee. And I'm like, that's not negotiable. And they're like, well, explain to us why we're paying that. I said, okay, I'll explain to you. So first I brought you the deal off market that you never would have saw. Secondly, you're going to buy it. And when you do, you're going to depend on me to get you whatever contractor or resource you need to make whatever handyman repairs you need to make in order for it to get rented. Then you're going to ask me to refer you to property management that doesn't screw you around and can actually find you tenants and help you. And then you're going to ask me throughout the whole process what I think about this and what I think about that. And should I do this? And should I do that? And what do you think about this tenant? And can you review their financial background and blah, blah, blah. The commission that I make on a sale has to do with the sale of the property itself. Itself. After that, all of the consulting that I do is not free. Like you have to pay for that. And I'm charging you $495 for what might end up being a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars worth of my time and advice. And it sounds like a good deal to me. And if you're an investor who's buying property for me all the time, you know, and like I know I'm constantly selling you a house like once a month, once a week, once a quarter, like then I'm okay, fine. I'll eat the cost, the $245 of that $495 that I give to my assistant per deal, right? Because that's what she gets paid and how she gets paid for her to effectively efficiently run my business so that you always know where you're at and what the questions are getting answered and title and all that stuff. So the streamlined process of like my whole business, this is a part of it. And I had to explain all that to them. And they still were like, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll do it, but we just don't think it's fair. Okay, fine. You know, when, when, we Adios, close, muchachos. Yeah, when we close the deal and you ask me for a bunch of stuff, I'll sit down with you maybe one time. And then after that, I'll say, look, if you want me to give you advice, like it's going to be on an a la carte basis. So you want me to consult you? It's going to be a hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. I'll yeah. take a call from you. Every time I do, it's a hundred dollars. You know, and then at the end of the day, you're going to spend a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. That's not greed. I'm I'm a high level uh, investment based agent where my time is money, and everybody's calling me. Just like when you're an investor, like you know, you're not doing it. You're doing it. Let, let me say this: you're doing it because you appreciate the process. You're doing it because you want to improve the neighborhoods. You're doing it because you want to improve the equity position. You're doing it because you want to be a part of like quote unquote revitalization. But you're also doing it because you're an investor and you're trying to make money and you're doing it as an entrepreneur. And this is a very lucrative business. And people understand that you're trying to make money. And that's it's 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 funny sometimes. Like it's the newer people that don't understand like the whole sure. process. And if they eventually don't, if they eventually don't, then I have to say, look, we're just not a fit. I'm going to just choose not to work with you anymore. And I'm going to focus my time and attention on more lucrative relationships because I only have so many hours in the day and I have to make sure that I serve my clients and, and also my own personal time efficiently. And I can't do that by fighting with people over like crumbs. It, it's not yeah. worth it for me. Um, and when it comes to like you as a consultant, uh, you know, or somebody who's going to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, helping someone get in a position where they can potentially grow their wealth at a very fast clip and, and, you know, get to the point where they can have financial freedom in whatever way that they define it, like that has value to it too. And people need to understand that this knowledge is power and this power is worth a lot more than you're going to spend for, you know, the advice that you're going to get.
you know, yeah. it's very safe. Well, it was like what we were talking about in the previous episode with trust. And if you, you know, whether it's a family member or whatever, and like, but also work with people that you like. Like mm-hmm. if I don't, if I don't like you, I'm going to have a hard time working with you. Yeah. If you don't like me, um, <clears throat> you know, you're going to have a hard time working with, with me. So if you don't like me, like, don't ask me for my advice. I won't, you won't hurt my feelings. Yeah. Right. Like, not, every, not all relationships are made to, to be. You know, it's just no. not the way it works. And, you know, I want to offer, you know, when I do these podcasts, I want to offer people a lot of different perspectives. I don't want them to think like real estate is the only thing. And I'm the only person you should talk to. And like, you should never seek any other advice or any other opportunity beside what I'm selling. Cause I'm not selling uh, a get rich quick program, like yeah. where I'm marketing, like, Hey, pay me $10,000 and I'm going to teach you almost everything you need to know to be like me until you get to that point and then i'm gonna charge you another fifteen thousand to go through my boot camp where i'm going to teach you almost enough and it's like you become a scientologist then right (laughs) you're buying into this belief that you're going to pay for and pay for and pay for to get to the end that there is no end and you just dump your money and your time and your effort and eventually you get blood dry or you realize that you're getting uh scams you know and this is no scam this is like you know myself two guys just talking about, you know, what we do as entrepreneurs and like what we say is not always the right thing, you know, for everybody. And it's not always the right system for everybody, but if it is like, we are the people who you should talk to. Yeah. I I talk about charlatans and phonies quite often. And and just like you said, if there, if it's always like, we're going to teach you this, but then, you know, the, the webinar runs out of time and then on the next episode, we're going to teach you this. Yeah, It's like, no, it's like, Let's get to, let's cut to the chase. Like you said, we're busy. We're just here to like, we we're doing it because we enjoy it. Yeah. But you know, like, like the back to the relationship thing, like I don't want to burn anyone. Like yeah. my conscience, uh, my conscience doesn't fuck with that. Like yeah. I don't feel yeah. good. Yeah. I want to feel good. I want to help people. Yeah. That's another idea with the, you know, the shared ethos and real estate. And Bitcoin and the whole proof of worth thing, work thing. It's like these things don't happen easily, and it takes a lot of time. They aren't get quick rich schemes. Building up a rental portfolio, you may not realize any income for a very long time. You know, depending on what your goal is and when you want to stop, or you know what, uh, yeah, basically what your goals are. Bitcoin, yeah. you don't buy Bitcoin and then you're rich the next day. It doesn't work that way. No. Um, you know, it's, and, and the cool thing about Bitcoin is the only way to get it really is by earning it. You have to buy it with your hard earned money. You know, you can't buy real estate and, and become successful in real estate without earning it. It's extremely rare and extremely hard to do it. Otherwise, the only alternative to that is like, you know, having parents who built up a portfolio and they hand something off to you. Right. And then if you're not if you're not prepared, if you've never done anything in the business, you're probably going to fuck it up. Yeah. No, if I'll you tell you. At yeah. one point when I grew up, my grand my family are from Belgium, right? So my great grandparents and grandparents came here from Belgium after the World War or whatever. They escaped Belgium. My grandfathers came and they basically it took them 10 years to get the whole family here or whatever. So growing up, they came into the logging industry in northern Michigan cuz that was the only place where people were like French Canadian. And there was a lot of different immigrants that they could speak the language and learn. And they did. So then they transported themselves into the Detroit market for like the car boom for Chrysler and Ford and GM, where like a regular person with no real education could go down there and make good money. And like the heyday of life where one man or one woman would work, they had a car, they had a house, they had a cottage, whatever. And everybody could survive like that and grow a family of five, 10 kids. And they could afford to live like that. Those days are gone. But when I grew up, my grandmother was an accountant. My grandfather worked for Chrysler as a guy, you know, that was on the line. You know what I mean? He was like a, you know, not a skilled trade until later, later. And when he didn't retire until he was like 76 years old. And I was taught like you spend less than what you make. And then you put your money into a 401k. And if back at that time, you know, companies were giving extremely good matches and like the market was going, you know, you could actually build up some good amount of wealth. And I thought 
for myself, like, okay, well, I'm just going to work a job. I'm going to pay all my bills. I'm going to own a home. I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to put my money into 401k aggressively and I'm going to ride that wave. And by the time I'm like the age of retirement, I'm going to be a millionaire. And then 2009 came and I lost 50% of my money, like over a three month, four month period of time. And it was went down. So I called my financial advisor or whatever and said, I want my money out. And he talked me out of it. No, whatever. And I lost more money. And finally I said, give me my money. I paid the penalties. I took my money. I said, I personally will never invest in the market like that again. And people are like, well, if you invest over the period of X amount of time, like you can retire a millionaire after 20 years or whatever, that's assuming that the market continues to gain at like 8% or more, but that doesn't account for the loss. Cause if, if you sit down and you do the math about when I lost that money, if I would have kept that money and let it go down to almost nothing, and I would have continued forward, continued investing the same amount of money into that to this day, it would have took me so long to get back where I was before I started to get to the rule of seven, where it starts growing again on its own. Like that was a sucker move for me and people like me at that time. A lot of people lost. Now they're saying, oh, the market, you know, it's closing at all time high and this and that and the other thing. And people, they they continue to put their money into that stuff because it's like the same idea of like you go to school, get good grades, go to college, get a degree, get a good job and your life is good. All of that shit is a sham now. You go to school, you get good grades, you go to college, you end up with $150,000 in student loan debt and you get out of college with a $60,000 a year job where you can barely afford a house. You can't even have a car payment and all this stuff. This is the American dream, what it's come to. This is where it's at. And and people that are investing in the stock market, it's not to say that you can't have success doing that, but if we face an economic downturn, a, a recession, a depression of anything, and we're on the cusp of that with all these things that are going on in the world, you are you could easily have a million dollars that go down to 300000 And then how yeah. long will it take? What if you're at the age of 58 when that happens? What if you're at the age of 62? You know? Yeah. Then what? That's, the that's when depression and nihilism and <laughs> suicide rates jack up, divorce rates jack up. And those yeah. are the cultural, societal effects of an inflationary environment. Right. So and if, if you save, if you save in U.S. dollars, the American dream is dead. Yes, I agree Even with if, you, hundred yeah, percent. You know that's the inflation rate. Prior to COVID, it was seven percent a year. So what is that? Every every ten years, if you save in dollars, then you're losing approximately fifty five percent. I think something like that. Yeah, fifty five percent of your wealth. I agree with that 100%. And um, um, you can't, like, the regular old school vehicle for how to be a human is they, it, like we talked about from the very beginning, that has failed us. Yes. And uh, back to, you know, the great financial crisis, when you, when you experience that ha happening, that's when uh, the creator of Bitcoin, his, you know, his or their name was Satoshi Nakamoto. I have his quote here on the very first um, block. It's like kind of like the, without going into too much detail, it's like the uh, first transaction of Bitcoin. He was able to inscribe a message on it. And we're assuming he was British. We don't know. But the Times, 3rd January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So Satoshi came up with all this stuff during the massive financial crisis of 2008, 2009, specifically to kind of offer humanity an alternative to that. So while all this stuff was going on and we were getting fucked out of, you know, wealth and all those things, while banks were getting bailed out, you know, it wasn't like all the banks got bailed out. It was the ones who had political connections to specific people got bailed out, others died. You know, there was some some buyouts where, you know, they, you know, merged some banks like uh what was it, Wells Fargo or Wachovia, something like that. Yeah. And they bought each other out. So all of those in in the auto industry also, obviously Detroit, uh, I think GM got Dude, what was it like? Forty-five billion dollars or something like that. It was a ridiculous amount of money. And Insane. Then, the problem then, I had with uh, that too was, you know, you're going to give a bailout. Let's say to let's say Bank of America, right? 
Bank of America is a predatory lender that's known for buying uh, distressed notes, Shady bad debt, debt whatever. Yeah. Like you, you're bailing them out. Why would we bail out someone who signed up for it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't well, make any it's, sense. And it's not with their money. It's with our money. Yeah. It's through printing. Right. So screw Dave. He lost, you know, 50 to 70% of his wealth. Who cares about that guy? Right. Let's give it to these politically connected uh, individuals and groups. And that's that's really the backdrop from which Bitcoin was created. It was like, this is so disgusting. Like, I've had enough of it. And Satoshi somewhere, whoever he or they are, absolute genius, created this system where it's a meritocracy. You cannot corrupt Bitcoin. You can't, you can't steal someone else's Bitcoin through printing of money and then give it to someone that you prefer. Right. Which yep. is what inflation is. Inflation is creating value out of thin air saying, I just created all this value and now I get to give it to the people that I want at the expense of everyone else. Yeah. In there. With crypto, you're buying bars of gold and putting them in your safe at home essentially. And you, you can see it, taste it, touch it, feel it like you're in control of it and where you house it and how you uh, decide to disperse it if you choose to. No one can, no one can, it's, it's the hardest asset to confiscate in history if you self-custody and it's impossible to inflate. So yeah. it removes the opportunity for bad actors to steal from you. Right, or poor government. Our poor old government you know, needs your tax dollars and they can't steal it when you save it in Bitcoin. Right. And I think that that, you know, we'll leave it at that. And we'll probably get into another episode next week where we talk a little bit more about like the particulars of like how to buy it. Um, Cause I want to have Adam on one more time so we could talk about like, you know, we've gone, um, we've talked about a lot of topics and I like to do that with this show. Cause I don't want people to get bored and think we're trying to sell some, you know, thing cause we're not. But what I want to talk about is, like, what is Bitcoin? How do you purchase it? Where do you put it? How do you liquidate it? All of those things. I think people want to know about that because there are a lot of people that do know about crypto, but there are a lot of people that they only know the the cliff notes, you know, about crypto. And they're like, they see it, but they're kind of afraid to, to dive in. And, and I think that we should do a show where we talk about like, okay, crypto for dummies, Bitcoin, this is what it is this is how it is this is what you do to acquire it and this is how you would uh put it to work and eventually see results from yeah. it as and far I, as dollars I, it sounds like i'm saying a lot of bombastic things but um you know everything is honest and truthful um and i can go into the basics as to why why it is the hardest asset in history to confiscate what makes yeah. it secure Yep. You know, what makes it incorruptible, stuff like right. that. But so also the, for the, sorry, real quick, but yeah, the, the, real, the real estate people out there, um, eventually another episode, but we can always talk about the uh, heat waste utilization with uh, Bitcoin mining, which yeah. is Bitcoin yeah. mining is a big part of Bitcoin and part of the security aspect. Of yeah, it, you were telling me about that. Cool. And that is interesting to say the least. Yeah. about mining and like housing mining and utilizing the energy from that uh to you know use it for other means and, and things like that but anyway we're running up against the end of our session here so we will do a part three of this for next week adam will come back on he may have a crown we don't know what he's up to down there <laughs> uh, there might be a few tanned ladies sitting there next to him for moral support whatever he decides is it's good but we're going to wrap it up thank you for joining the detroit buy hold invest podcast david rabior adam cook you can visit me at www.detroitbuyholdinvest.com or you can call me at 313-451-0448 Adam, do you want to drop uh, any info for the people in case they want to talk to you? Yeah, uh, you guys can go check out my website, greenriverhome.com. Um, that's got all my general information and what we're working on. So that would awesome. be a good, good place to go. And also, next week, I will be shirtless with a coconut. So hey, that, you know that's what? what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's what the people want, and that's what the people will get. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Adam, we'll have you on next week. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thanks, dude. Appreciate right. it. Yep. Have a good day. Bye-bye.